the reason I'm, I'm walking my way through this is that there are many believers, I wrote this on your paper, there are many who do not believe the antediluvian world ever existed because it is only recorded in the Bible and they don't believe the Bible. I had a professor that thought the whole antediluvian period uh, was mythology and fables. I told him this didn't fit this didn't fit well with Jesus because he quoted from it all the time. But apparently, I would go home and I would tell Jane, this guy is driving me crazy. She would say, she, Jane's in her little quiet way would go like, well, why are you going to school? And I said, hmm, to get a degree, Well, then get your degree and get out of school. So I did. I quit, I quit grumbling and griping about what he believed, fed him back what he believed, and got my degree, right? Did I believe it? I didn't believe that stuff, right? Went to college to get a degree. Apparently, I didn't go to college to get knowledge because I wasn't getting a lot of it, so I went and got a degree. And I, I tell the kids the same thing. They go like, oh, why are you going to college? Get a degree. Well, be quiet. Feedback what the, what, the, what the professor has and get your degree and get out of there. That's, if that's what you're going for, right? That's what most people go for. That's why I went to college. I went to college to get a degree. thought it would help me. I didn't know that it helped me. But I got it anyhow. I don't know if it ever helped me. I'll tell you what's helped me. Of course, I'm, I'm a pastor. If I'd have stayed as a dentist, it would help me, wouldn't it? But a lot of kids get degrees. They get degrees in all kinds of things. One of my good friends that I played football with back 100 years ago, it was an All-American, went to Indiana, They created a degree. He was all American. He was all American in Indiana and went on to play for the Chicago Bears and then went to New Orleans. I mean, he was quite a ball player. He always dated the smartest girls in the school. <laughs> That's how he got through high school, that and football. So some, sometimes, you know, they, they created, they, they created um, park and recreation. We didn't have either one of them where I lived. <laughs> we, I'd never heard of a park in my life. Uh, you parked a car, but that was about it. You didn't go to a park and recreation. I mean, that was after hours and usually too tired. I was a farm kid. Well, anyhow, but he got a park and recreation from Indiana, and there wasn't no such thing as parks in my town, anyhow. anyhow. Might have been in that city. Listen, I, I want to give you eight markers in the antediluvian world, geographical markers, and one of those markers still exists. And we know where it is, and we know what it is. But the rest of them, we know they exist somewhere off from that marker. Eden. Five rivers are going to flow out of Eden. One is the main river, and it's going to divide into four. We read that in the first period. Out of Eden. In Eden, which was apparently a pretty good-sized place, in Eden, God built a park and recreation. <laughs> now I'm into that. And he put my buddy in charge of it. No, not really. Because he had a degree from Indiana. They put, he put the garden, he, he, he planted, it says God planted a garden in Eden, and we call it the Garden of Eden. Agreed? 
And we know what all he put in there. Two things that was really important he put in that was the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of lives. And when Adam sinned, he shut down the garden, right, and expelled him from the tree of life. All right, so Eden was a, was a place. When Adam, when he went expelled, he went east of Eden. So it was, a, it was a, it, listen, and it was a, it was a land, a, a marker. It was apparently a good size marker. Everybody knew where Eden was and knew apparently what east of Eden was. So we know about that, and I wrote scripture on it, and let me ask this. See, this is the kind of stuff that drives me nuts. This one river that flowed out of Eden, right, one, and divided in four, where'd that water come from? Well, you remember from Genesis 1-2? Remember that water that was wrapped around the earth? When he began the days of creation, day one, day two, day three, what he did is he separated that water into two places. All that water that circled the earth in one, two was now placed in reservoirs above the heavens and below the earth. That's where that water's coming from. You know something else? If you live in Moody or Odenville or someplace like that, you could well have, you could very well, very well have a well. Right? Where do you think that water came from? Right? Doctrinal principle. God's logistical grace. God's logistical grace. A lot of that water flowed out. A lot of that water flowed out. And they still had enough for the flood to come. Agreed? Out of that, out of that water reservoir in the earth, one river flowed and divided. That's a pretty good-sized river, people. And flowed into four. We have the Garden of Eden in Eden. Adam was placed there and later expelled. Th third chapter, verse 24, not on your paper. And expelled, and it was identified towards the east in Eden. When Cain was expelled, in the fourth chapter, verse 16, expelled from Eden, he went to the land of Nod. <laughs> ah, that's all right. I have fun anyhow. All right, so there's a land called Nod. That and it drove, it drove that was one of the things that drove drove my professor nuts. You know, he, he, is that, that's a fairy tale kind of place. You know, what I mean? <laughs> the land of Nod. I guess he compared it to land of Oz or something. I don't know. But there was a land of Nod, and Cain went to it. He was expelled to it. There, there is a second river, the first one coming out of Eden. We have another river. One of the four is Pison. It flows around the land. Again, Kishon, it flows around the land. That's either peninsula in our terms. From a post-Diluvian standpoint of looking back at that, that's either peninsula, like going around Florida, or it's an ocean like going around Africa. And so it could either be a peninsula or a continent. Many of us, myself included, consider them continents because of what came out of the post-Diluvian period. When the, post when the flood is over, we have 
now in the Andalusian world, we had two continents. In the post diluvian world, we have seven, right? Seven continents? Yeah, I think seven. Was when I went to school. I don't know how many they have anymore. Seven may be too high to count. Then we have a fourth river. We have a fourth river called the Tigris. We're familiar with that from the post diluvian world. But here's what's interesting. The Bible says in 2.14 that it flowed east of Assyria. Then what we, what we wonder is Moses talking from the 5th century, because we know Moses is writing, is he talking about the location of that from a post-Diluvian idea of Assyria, or was there actually a place called Assyria that was later called Assyria in the post-Diluvian world? See? Either way, we got the same place. But I find that interesting. Is that is Assyria a nation like we know it to be? Assyria conquered Israel. Is that the Assyria we're talking about? Or was this a preliminary Assyria that people attached to the post-Diluvian world? See, curious minds want to know. And then we have the, the river uh, Euphrates. And we know that the Tigris and Euphrates in the post diluvian world is certainly attached to Assyria idea. Assyria and Nineveh. Jonah, things like that. One of the things that's of interest to me in this final river Euphrates, <clears throat> in Genesis 15-18, in the Abrahamic Covenant, I want to show you something. In the Abrahamic Covenant, this comes up. In Genesis, in, and Genesis, um, what was it, 15, 18? 15, 18. Now, what, what Abraham is, this is part of the Abrahamic Covenant dealing with the land section. And it starts up about verse 13. God said to Abram, know, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. That's, that's talking about the prophecy of Egypt. That's the prophecy of Egypt given to Abraham. I will also judge the nations whom they, whom they will serve in the land that's the seven Canaanite, nation, Canaanite nations. Uh, uh, and afterwards, they will come out with many possess possessions. As for you, you will go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Verse 17. It came about when the sun had set, and it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking... Uh, uh, appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch would pass between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. Here we are. To your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. When we get to Abraham, we have gone through 10 generations of the Shemites. Of the post-Diluvian period. The, the Shemites came off the boat. That's, a, that's the family, the, the family of Shem came off the boat and uh, that's their descendants. But he talks about this river of Euphrates. Now, here's, here's what I think is the big clue. The mountain where the ark rested, Ararat, Ararat. Uh, 
I forget what that. There was a printing company in Birmingham, Dewberry. We were talking about it early, Dewberry. Um, he was avid art guy. He knew more about the art than any, any one human being I ever knew. And had made and had been there and seen it. Right, Don? He'd been, he'd, he'd had, while he could get in, he had several ex, explorations in it. And actually saw, saw what he believed to be the ark iced in up there. And he spent his entire life devoted to that idea. I don't know what ever, ever happened to him uh, in the, well, I guess like he went the way of all men, but, but here's the point. The ark floated over all mountains. The Bible says the, there was so much water that the ark floated, floated above and tells you how high, 15 feet above all the, all the mountains and rested at the top of, of, of Mount Ararat. So we, had, we have a definite marker of the ancient world. Climb up on that hill, you can look in every direction, agreed? Mountain, not a hill, but a mountain. The highest mountain in the ancient world. So when the ark rests, they got out in the Lord. They had a sense of direction. Would you, would you agree with that? They, if for no other reason, they knew east and west just by the sun, right? We, my grandfather and I, he would take me, um, every year we would, for grandma, we would go get mushrooms out of Black Forest. We would come home with a couple of gunny bag, bags full. Grandma would can them, and we ate mushrooms the rest of the year. My grandfather would always tell me, if you get lost, you, the Black Forest was called that name because you could get lost in a heartbeat in Black Forest. You couldn't see out of it. You get deep in it, you couldn't see. You really had to know how to get in and out of it. But the interesting thing, there was a road that went, and Black Forest was on this side, I don't know how many acres, a lot. And everybody on the other side were farmers. They had farms. <laughs> so when we went to Black Forest, a lot of people hunted in that forest and things like that. But on the other side of Black Forest was Lake Michigan. So my grandfather, when I was a little boy, I always went with him. You know, I, I was his shadow. Where he went, I went, unless he said, go, you know, no, you can't you stay with grandma and protect her. Uh -huh. And he would say, if you ever get lost in Black Forest, go west to Lake Michigan. So how do, you, how do you know, little bitty kid, how do you know? He said, well, you go by the, the sun. Oh, well, if I got lost there at night, I'd have to wait till the next day. Yeah, all right. But, and so we would go down to Lake Michigan after work, after farming, and sit at the lake and talk. Lake Michigan, my grandfather and I, was about a mile from our, barn, from our house. And he, he would say, see the sun setting? We would do it early in the mornings, especially on weekends, and see the sunrise and see the sunset. It was magnificent over, 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 the, over Lake Michigan. It is a beautiful sight when you see the sun goes down in it, over water. And I thought, where did that thing go? And so those were lessons that my grandfather used to teach me that. Yeah, then he taught me about moss on the side of a tree, and he went, yeah, 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 yeah. And so... I felt really confident as a very little bitty kid that if I got lost, I could get out of there. Then he taught me how to climb up in a tree and find one that has a fork and lean back in and sleep all night and then watch for the sun. Follow it. I never got lost in dark forest, black forest. Never got lost. I never, tell you the truth, I never went that deep in it. <laughs> I don't know that would depend, but I was confident as a kid that I could walk out to Lake Michigan 
Remember how, remember the direction you walk into, then walk out the opposite. Walk up when you go out, walk, turn left and go down to Whiskey Creek and you'll be home. Well, anyhow. Markers is my point. When they got off that ark, they had a definite historical marker, agreed? I mean, they could look, they, they knew where the east was, they knew where the west was, if for no other reason, the sun. And I think that was really important to the names we have after the flood. It's just something to think about. You can read about this in Genesis, the 7th chapter, verse 20, and the 8th chapter, verse 4, because I find them to be important. In fact, I assigned my good friend Don an exercise for me, and I hope he can, I hope he can do it because he's, he's, about, he's a master when it comes to historical uh, landmarks. He's the best I've ever known. Point number two, God is in control of human history, and when he gets that report done, I'll bring it to you if he finds anything of relevance. God is in control of human history as well as, as human history as well as individual history. I think sometimes we get caught up in all that. Listen, the thing that the antediluvian world proves to me, shows to me, is that God cares about human history and individual history. He cares about human history because there was a whole human history developed in the Antilopian world. He cares about personal because we got names and we got a boat trip, right? That's all personal. We know the ancestral of the, in the lineage of Christ in Genesis 5. They're all listed. And then again in Luke 3. I, I just find this stuff interesting when people say, well, how do you know, how do, why do you believe that? I just, well, I, first of all, I believe the Bible. And second of all, it's, it's, it's just so interesting to me. It's ancient history. As Peter said, this is ancient history that was written about and important. Moses had, an, had earlier explained that God restored the creation of the heads of the earth for mankind, Isaiah 45, 18. Genesis 1, 2, and here's one, Zechariah 12, 1. Now, can I tell you how, it, and there's a, listen, when you hit Zechariah, you're all over eschatology. You know what eschatology is? The study of the what? Last days. The second coming of Christ, we call it. Now, Zechariah is one of those great books on the second coming of Christ and what's going to happen and all that. But here's what I find people can't do. They can't find Zechariah. It's the easiest book in the Old Testament to find. You go to Malachi, it's the next book back. Right? Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. It's the last of the last. So, in... Zechariah 12.1, right? In Zechariah 12.1. It's interesting how Zechariah 12.1 begins. It says, The burden of the word of God concerning Israel. Is that not an interesting statement? The burden of the word of God concerning Israel. And in eschatology, you know what he's talking about? The tribulation. It was a burden to God's soul to write down in the scriptures the judgment that was going to come on mankind. He does not take pleasure in that. He called it the burden of I find that so interesting, talking about the heart of God. God is not willing that any perish, that even when he writes about perishing and judgment, it's a burden on his soul to write it in the word of God. That's something. Why would you take anything less than serious about that? You know, and he's talking about the tribulation in the fifth cycle. 
of discipline to Israel. It was a burden to write about it. It was a burden on God to put that in the Word of God as a decreed statement. God follows His plan, design, and eternity past, the eternal life conference of Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. And, and listen how this thing is going. Here's global warming. Let me show you global warming in the end. Let me show it to you in the end. In the first chapter, which is, comes out of Psalms 102 as a quote, in the first chapter of Hebrews 10, 11, and 12, Listen, I talk to people all the time that are climate people, right? I mean, I just, you know, they're everywhere. So I engage them. As soon as I reach for the Bible, they don't want to talk. Is that not interesting? Does that not tell you something? Now, every once in a while I find a guy that's really interesting, and he'll go in the Bible with me, and he goes like, whoa, watch this. Uh, let me get Hebrews. He's in, a pa he's in a passage. Psalms 102, he's quoting, the writer of Hebrews is quoting Psalms 102, 25, verse 10, then verse 26, and then verse 27. Are you with me? You got to study Bible? It shows you that, doesn't it? Well, somewhere it does. Here's what he said. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. Watch this. They will perish, but you remain. Do you know what the earth is, what's happening to the earth? The heavens and the earth, the created heavens and the earth, they're wearing out. They were put under the curse of Adam as well. Genesis 3, we'll talk about it when we get there. They're wearing out, like you. You wear out, right? We'll wear out, right? We won't wear out. The only place you can, listen, the only place you, your body can old, get older and your, your, your soul and spirit can get younger is with the Word of God. Renewed, renewed daily. Otherwise, you're going to get old outside and inside. So, listen. If you want to be young at heart, study the Word of God. And I'll tell you, it will reflect beauty on the outside no, no matter what age you are. It, it strikes me interesting that when Pharaoh saw Sarah and she's like 70 or 75 or something, he goes like, whoa, what a beauty. I mean, either they don't have women over there or she's looking pretty good at 75 or whatever. She's up, up in age compared, even compared to in her generation. Well, anyhow, I just got off track here a minute. Well, I lost Hebrews. Let me get back to Hebrews. Here's climate change. If you ever get in a conversation with these people, if you, if you got anybody in your family under 30, especially if they went to college, they're as dumb as a brick. So you got, you got you can talk with these kids if they if they believe in the Bible. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all become like, like, like old garments. <laughs> and like a mantle, you will roll them up, and like a garment, they will all be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. And that's how, listen to that. All this stuff is wearing out. It's going to be rolled up one day. It's going to be rolled up like an old piece of stuff and, and given the Salvation Army. We're going to give all of that. <laughs> We're going to take it down to the Salvation Army. Give it to them. They probably take it. They don't care. Do you know that the Godhead has the identity of Omega, Alpha and Omega? You know what that means in Greek? The beginning and the end, right? 
You know how I know that? Because that's the way they're identified at the end of the book. When you get to the end of the book, that's how they're identified. Well, I'm curious minds want to know. How about this one? The blood of the prophets? See, I'm, I'm talking about the antediluvian world. Look, watch this. The blood of the prophets of God have existed since the, since the foundation of the world. He's talking about creation. And he mentions one person out of that period, Abel. The blood of Abel. No fable in that, is there? Uh, uh, I don't think so. Satan, watch this now, because here's the game going on with us today. Satan attempts to silence the message of Christ. We call it censor. And if that doesn't work, he will kill the messenger. You understand that? Of course, he can't do it without permission, right? And if he does get permission, that person that dies is a martyr. A martyr, you know, that's like superhero. That's like Superman. I don't know what to compare it to. How do I know that? John 14, 1 through 12. John the Baptist. First one out. You know what I mean? With, with clarity in the Bible. Biblical history tells us that Satan can never silence the message. Can never silence it. Because why? The, because the word of God is as old as God is, right? I'm not talking about the written. I'm talking about the believed. Because it was, it, listen, it was, it was designed in eternity past. The book you carry around wears out to remind you that you, everything is temporal. But the words in it are eternal. Yeah, yeah. I love Jesus' prayer. He's getting ready to go to Gethsemane. He talks with the Father. Father, I desire that they also, all the people that are followers of his, especially the disciples, whom you have given me, be with me where I am. so that they may see my glory, which you have given me. What he would like to see is for them to see it before it happens, so that they will see the, the dynamics of God in, the light, in life. Do you understand what I said? They want the disciples to see what's going to happen before they see it, so when it happens, they know that God is right on schedule, and God has a wonderful plan for whatever's going on, no matter what the circumstances look like, God's plan is greater than what the circumstances look like in your life. Agreed? Because they look pretty dingy right there with him dying on the cross unless you understood the plan. See, that's the point. Watch this now. He says, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. That's eternity past, people. Well, You still might be thinking, what's the point of this whole study you're doing? And I started with it. I'm not going to reread it, but I started with it. In 2 Peter, the third chapter, I read through 3 through 8. I'm back to it. That's the point of this. The point of showing you everything is to show you that God's in everything, no matter where. It don't matter if he was in the antediluvian world. It doesn't matter if he was in not or, or, or asleep. It doesn't matter where you are, God is there. He wants to participate in your life. He wants you to participate in His. So you, you need to rethink that. You know, God has all of your time planned. Kind of like a wife, ain't it? He has all your life planned. For time and eternity. <laughs> now you're going to get a break. Eternity. <laughs> and not till then. There are two important phrases for me in this Second Peter 3. Know 
And notice, God prepared the anti-living world like He did the post-living world for man and man for the first and second coming of Christ. What sign has God given us in the post-Diluvian period to show God's Word is certain and that Christ is coming again? What is it? The rainbow. Another marker out of the antediluvian world. Another marker out of the antediluvian world. Well, you've been a wonderful class. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll pledge out and we will go home or wherever you go. Father, we're so thankful that you're a God not only of human history, but of individual history. We're thankful for that. We're glad to be a part of the plan of God in a historical look and know that you are present with us every day, every moment. We have access, and, and beyond that, we have the Holy Spirit living, the third member of the Godhead living inside our bodies every moment of every day until checkout time. And we're thankful for that. There's no excuse for the church. There's no excuse for the Christian not to be on top of his game in the plan of God. Because we have been so wonderfully provided for in the divine plan of God. I pray, Father, that we would stop looking outside for the solutions of our life that come from inside with the word of God working mightily in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Rick, if you'll pledge us out of here. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hmm.